your reactions to this testimony we just heard? So what we heard from this witness this morning was quite compelling. He used language that you wouldn't normally expect a witness to use. The two quotes that I look at are, one, this is crazy, and then two, absolute craziness. When describing what uh, was occurring in, in this investigation. So to just give a quick summary, essentially, uh, Mr. Paul had come to the AG's office asking for an investigation of federal officers. Uh, the data that he brought was metadata from a couple of files. Uh, the AG's office had done extensive investigation on it, looked at it, had their own forensic examiners look at it, but in the end could not find any evidence that there was any impropriety on the part of the federal investigators. So Ken Paxton at this point says, well, I agree with you, this investigation should be closed, but apparently what happened was he went back and said, well, we're going to hire outside counsel on taxpayer money to end up uh, doing further investigations on this, even though we haven't found anything ourselves. So I can see why Mr. Penley says that this is uh, highly unusual, using the word, this is crazy, or the phrase, this is crazy, because it would be absolutely uh, insane for uh, the AG's office to continue investigation even after something like this occurred. Wouldn't and, you agree, Josh? And Josh, I would. You, Josh, you know Mark Penley, right? Correct. I've worked with him over the last few months. He is an assistant district attorney now in Dallas. Uh, a lot of my practice uh, revolves around cases in Dallas. Uh, there isn't a more honorable man uh, defense is going to have a hard time making any points or any headway with him uh, and his veracity, especially how uh, descriptive he is on some of the situations that uh, Attorney General Paxton was trying to have him do. Uh, for instance, uh, you're talking about, if you think about it, a, a, an individual who is ex-military, worked in a big civil firm, assistant attorney general, assistant U.S. attorney, uh, a DA, uh, church going man, family man, and then you're trying to get him to investigate federal magistrate judges, U.S. attorneys, U.S. Uh, uh, prosecutors, uh, rangers, anybody who had any dealing with the Nate Paul, Nate Paul case, which as he said is crazy and listening to his testimony, it is crazy. It makes no sense. Uh, and obviously well, and, the, and the testimony here is all very similar uh, in terms of just how you know crazy this is well it's just it, it you're having attorney general paxton excuse me is having his assistant attorney general mark penley investigate the people who are investigating attorney general paxton's friend nate paul right there alone raises severe red flags and remember who else is involved here. It's not just uh, Mark Penley, but Mark, but Mateer, who was Jeff Mateer, was a part of this conversation. There were a number of different uh, people that were all on the same page, saying, "Look, this is a highly unusual situation," and so that I think creates uh, some real concern. I think for uh, Paxson's attorneys. I'm in, I'm curious to see on cross examination how they try to impeach these witnesses. We'll we'll learn soon how that works. It's going to be very difficult to impeach Mr. Penley, I can tell you that right now, based on his testimony, based on his character, uh, and the fact that Attorney General Paxton actually agreed with him at first, and then they went and tried to go the outside attorney route after this supposed metadata information uh, failed to convince them. While we're sitting here, I got a tweet from my mother, and my mother and I attend, uh, no, my family attends a church here in town and uh, Mr. Penley actually teaches a Sunday school class. He has impeccable credentials. He is a, a family man, as, as Josh points out, such a difficult witness to uh, impeach in, in a cross-examination. So I think it's going to be highly interesting uh, in the next uh, a few moments after the break to see how the uh, Paxton attorneys attempt uh, to impeach this man of, of, of great credential and 
uh, reputation around town as being really uh, a good person, just a good human being in general. Well, and all of these guys, all of these witnesses that we've seen so far, uh, Jeff Mateer, uh, Ryan, Ryan Vassar, Ryan Banger, uh, and also David Maxwell, all of these guys, they've presented their conservative bona fides, their, uh, maybe not so much with Maxwell in terms of the religion thing, but all of these guys have been presented as being people who are, you know, strong in their faith. You know, you heard um, when when Penley's talking this morning, he's talking about Jesus and the gospel and how and how his faith guides him and what he does. I mean, how do you how does Ken Paxson's team impeach somebody like this? I'm looking at the Twitter feeds from a number of people that are supporting uh, Ken Paxton um, on the outside. So this is people like director. Uh, Rinaldi, who is the chairman of the da of the Texas uh, GOP, it looks like the argument that they're making is that uh, in this instance you have A.G. Paxton, who is a champion of local government and Texas government, fighting against the strong arm of the feds. He's just using unorthodox techniques to fight back against what appears to be a very devious-minded federal government, you've got federal officers and federal judges who clearly have their thumb to a, on, on Texas to oppress Texans, and this is what was happening to Mr. Paul, and A.G. Paxton was only trying to help, uh, you know, a, a Texan, and in this instance, he had to go and use different techniques and because he knew that what was happening uh, it was, such a, was on, on such a grand scale that he had to do something. Uh, that was unusual, and that's why he brought in outside counsel. So that's the argument they're using. Uh, obviously, I'm not sure how. But based uh, on no evidence. <laughs> well, certainly. Well, I think the, you know, the the, the initial question is, uh, where was the data? Where was the information? Where was the evidence uh, in connection with this claim that the feds were doing this horrible thing? I mean, here's what he said that they did. They had a warrant. And the warrant for was for drugs and guns and all kinds of criminal activity. And then when that warrant was drafted, within two days, right before they got to the inspection and exec to execute the warrant, uh, the federal government, with a number of different people, changed the warrant to instead just include a white-collar criminal type investigation for documents and information. I mean, imagine what you're saying about the federal government. Uh, that would do this, right? They have this warrant and they change the warrant and everybody was in cahoots doing this. The judge, the magistrate, and the two federal agents that were executing the warrant would all have to be on the same page to make these changes and then keep it quiet, all because they wanted to attack this poor Mr. Paul, uh, who's just a, a hard-working, you know, mm -hmm. a real estate executive, a real estate, commercial real estate executive in, in Austin, Texas. So the, the, the whole government is going to go against him. And so A.G. Paxton, being the, the champion of, of the small little man, of course, is going to protect him. And that's the argument that they're trying to make. I, I just don't think it's going to hold up. Uh, and I think senators are going to have a difficult time um, uh, swallowing that line uh, as we see it, as it plays out at the next stage of the trial. Hey, Josh, why is the whole world out to get Nate Paul? I, I, I haven't figured that out. After listening to what was just uh, testified to, I'm, I'm kind of use Mr. Penley's uh, words. It's crazy. It, it, it is absolutely crazy, as Jason just said, that all these federal agencies are conspiring together to get Nate Paul. And, and uh, why Nate Paul? I don't understand it. A uh, couple of things. One, I wish... Uh, Rusty Hardin would have asked what this supposed metadata was. Obviously, it wasn't anything that was uh, acceptable to any of the attorney generals that it, it, you know, it, it showed that there was any problems in the case. Um, but I wish they would have said what that is. Uh, however, to get a federal magistrate, U.S. attorneys, FBI agents, and everybody else involved just after Nate Paul is nuts. It, frankly, legally and factually, it's not there. And it's not going to be there. And I think every senator who is actually listening to this uh, will see that, whether they will vote, whether the nine will vote uh, to impeach. That's a different question. That goes back to what you said earlier, why they were going to go through his uh, beliefs and his political parties and how he was raised. And I think they're 
uh, trying to relate him as a very strong conservative Republican and, and to get the nine Republican senators to come on board as well. That's interesting. I, I can't say who just sent me this text, but somebody just texted me that Mark Penley is the real deal, a total saint, uh, that he, this person's neither Republican or Democrat, but says that Mark Penley is everything good about humanity. And he says, I am skeptical of everyone, all in caps, but not Mark. I mean, this is pretty high T praise. Tanya, I got a text message uh, during the testimony from a assistant district attorney in Dallas who I've worked with for about 15 years when I was there. It said, FYI, Mark Penley is the office next to mine. I've never met a more honest, forthright man. Wow. I mean, so, you know, it just tells you something about this guy. And I, I know people that also know him in addition to you, Josh, and they, and they all, to a person, just say how honorable he, he is. Um, and they just, and, and, and what I don't understand is, you know, you would have to believe that, in, that Ryan Vassar, Ryan Banger, Jeff Mateer, David Maxwell, Mark Penley, and then a couple of the others, Blake Brickman and others, that they all got together for some unknown reason and decided <laughs> to conspire against their boss and do a coup. Because that seems to be the, uh, the, the side from Paxton's side. Is that they just didn't want to investigate these allegations, so they decided to do a coup, a coup against their boss. Can anybody explain why they would want to do that? Well, the early uh, attempts at explaining this were uh, around George P. Bush. As you know, we had an election in uh, 2020 where George P. Bush challenged A.G. Paxton. Of course, Paxton wins that, that primary in the runoff overwhelmingly. Um, and so the belief was that this was a way for the Bush people and people who were more centrist and Chamber of Commerce Republicans were going to take back this office and they were going to use these these rogue uh, people within the office of the attorney general to d make sure that uh, someone who was strongly MAGA like A.G. Paxton would be taken out and then the replacement of that individual would be someone like George P. Bush. That was the early argument that was made. It's faulty for a number of reasons. One, um, you know, the Bush team and the Bush campaign they lost. They lost that election. So that would mean that the governor of Texas would have to appoint someone who lost that election. And there's no history between Abbott and the Bushes to, to where you would expect that Abbott would appoint um, uh, George P. Bush. So I don't know if that is the case. And then two, there'd be a special election. So even if you had an interim AG, there would be a special election that would ultimately uh, determine who that AG would be. So I just don't think that's a very good argument that they're making. You know, again, if you're looking at what the people on the outside looking in who support AG Paxton are saying, it's, you know, this is driven by a, a rhino. They use the word rhino, Republican in name only, Speaker of the House over in the House. Uh, this is uh, a political witch hunt, much like we're seeing in in Washington, this is obviously an attack on uh, the MAGA culture uh, in Texas. This is an attempt to remove Trump-style uh, elected officials, and this is why they're doing this, because there's so much animus against MAGA in Texas. Again, ridiculous, because most Republicans in Texas identify as Trump voters and, and obviously very conservative and even a part of the MAGA community. So I just don't see that as holding much water either. It's it, Tanya, it's it's any reasonable, rational person listening to these witnesses will have to come to the conclusion that Paxton did what these people said. The question is, will politics render the verdict or will the facts of the impeachment inquiry render the verdict? And I think that's what's going to end up happening is you're going to have these Republican senators, whether they can get nine, are they going to go based on the evidence? Or are they going to go based on the politics? And that's what we're all here to see. You know, it's well, a great, that's the, that's it's, the it's, jump it's a, ball. It's we a don't great know. point. It's a great point that Josh is making. You know, having been an elected official in the House of Representatives, I know that going back home and starting to talk to the Republican Women's Club and the executive committees of the Republican uh, Party in my community, in my district, it would be very difficult to explain 
of the behavior of an AG that's engaged in this kind of, of corruption, right? I mean, you're talking not about something as esoteric as securities laws and white collar crime. You're talking about infidelity and you're talking about having a political donor pay for the remodeling of your kitchen. Allegedly. Are, I mean, allegedly, are, well, allegedly, allegedly again, on the re renovation. Alle <laughs> allegedly on the, on the, and allegedly on, well, I guess the affair is, is, is open, but I mean, yeah. uh, the people that vote in Republican Party primary votes are very strongly conservative. They're often religious and and, and, and all around Texas, they're rural religious, meaning you know, they're, church, they're going to church on Very Sunday morning, going. Sunday afternoon, and then on Wednesdays. And this kind of behavior is something that, that, that the people that go to those Republican Party primary meetings and women's clubs and, and groups, uh, they can, that really resonates with them. It's impactful for them because they're moral issues and not political issues. And you can't explain away politics, uh, these, this kind of behavior for politics. This is the kind of behavior that they just don't accept in their church or their Sunday school. Uh, and I don't think they're going to be able to accept it from their politicians, even though they might wear the, the bright red jersey. I think these kinds of issues are just a bridge too far for the average Republican. And so I think the senators that want to vote uh, against um, impeachment or against, in this instance, having him expelled, are going to have a lot of explaining to do with those groups if they decide to choose politics over what's truly, uh, what's, what's happening. Let, let's talk about that third meeting that, so they have the first two meetings, the first meetings with David Maxwell, and then you have the second meeting with Nate Paul, Penley, and of course, Paul and, and, and his attorney. Um, but then we have this third meeting and, you know, everybody thinks, or, you know, Penley and them and Maxwell think that when they come into this meeting that, that Ken Paxson's going to back them up <laughs> and agree that we're not going to keep investigating uh, or, you know, keep looking into this because there's, we, there's nothing to see here. We haven't found anything. You know, and, and Penley says that when they inform uh, Paul that they're, that they're done, uh, at that point, he basically says that Mr. Paul acted like we, we didn't know who the real boss was. How stunning a statement is to that to you guys? Shocking. I mean, you have a citizen who's under federal investigation, who, and then you have an attorney general who's supposedly backing his colleagues, and then we go in the room, or excuse me, they go in the room, and everything flips, and the subject of the investigation seems to think he's in charge of the entire room. And Mark Penley, and I, I know him personally, I've dealt with him personally, I can only imagine what was going through uh, his head and his heart at the time because he's sitting there thinking his boss is gonna back him and the next minute he finds out no uh, and he knows that his boss flipped on him and then he knows that this subject of the investigation is the one who thinks he's in charge of the entire meeting. Remember two days before, Penley and A.G. Paxton are in the hallway. Paxton asks how the investigation is going. The forensic authorities have already gone through the data. Penley informs him, look, we just don't, uh, we just don't have the data. It's not there. The, the approach that uh, Mr. Paul had asked for isn't yielding any information. We're going to close the investigation. Paxton at that point says, understood, I, 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 I agree. Uh, why don't you tell him at a meeting that's when they call this separate meeting so they go into the separate meeting and as josh points out you know once uh, penley tells him what they found and that this is not going to continue the investigation is stopped paul immediately throws uh, a fit right and he in, in the words that penley used he bows up his chest right he's he's showing who the alpha is in the room even though ag paxton is in the room Paxton also plays along with that. He's angry, he's showing anger that, that this is not uh, going in the direction uh, that Penley, uh, or that, that, that Mr. Paul would like. And so he's, he's almost taking like second chair to first chair Paul in this meeting. I mean, how astounding would that be to someone like Penley who had thought he was going into the room uh, to get the support of his boss and was just going to simply relay information about closing an investigation, and then to be attacked not only by a citizen who you're, you're, you know, presumably working for, but also the AG. He just must have been in his mind, like, thinking, "This is so surreal. I mean, what what is going on here?" And so, obviously, quite flummoxed, 
um, you know, Paul, uh, A.G. Paxton leaves the meeting, the meeting is no longer productive, so they close the meeting. And again, I, I'm guessing at this point, Penley's thinking to himself, okay, so it's over. Th that was painful, but at least now this chapter's been closed. And then to find out uh, a few weeks later that, no, it's not closed at all. In fact, A.G. Paxton's going to hire outside counsel to continue this investigation. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking. Uh, uh, as, as just a, as a lawyer, I would be shocked by that, but imagine working for the people of Texas and having taken your oath of office and then this is occurring before you. I mean, a man like Penley, who's such a, uh, a, a, a careful and thoughtful kind of a straight arrow. lawyer and a straight arrow, imagine, Very. imagine the angst he must have felt by hearing what was happening and, and what he was being asked to do in, fa in the face of this clear, overwhelming evidence that uh, this situation should have been uh, taken care of immediately by closing the investigation, and yet it didn't. Jason, how about the fact that he thinks he's going into this meeting, everything's going to be great, and three quarters of the way through the meeting when everybody bows up, his boss just leaves the meeting. <laughs> Think about that. Uh. I mean, just, everyone's, yelling at, everyone's yelling at Mark. Everyone's <laughs> bowing up at Mark. They're getting all mad, and the attorney general says, I'm out of here. Yeah. See you. <laughs> I mean, think about that. <laughs> it, it is it's pretty crazy, guys. We're going to dip back in. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's back on the back on the dais.